Well, let's see what I can do about the fact that this is reflecting a black sky. A new feature in Houdini 11 is, uh, well, a new, not a new feature, but a new implementation, is the environment light. Uh, environment lights existed in Houdini 10, but they've been adapted a little bit in Houdini 11. So I've laid down an environment light, and I'm going to give it an environment map here. And I've got a, a sky map of some kind that I've, I've created. Uh, and there's a new parameter here, which is rendering mode. And we can see that it either provides direct lighting, ambient occlusion, or here, ray tracing background. That's what I'm going to select, ray tracing background. And what that means is that when a ray hits uh, nothing as it goes out, it's given the color of the environment at that point. So if I have a look at my render view, uh, we can see everything's gone rather dark. And the reason for that is that now I've got a light in the scene, uh, the render is not automatically adding a headlight. So I'm going to need temporarily at least to provide uh, another bit of lighting. So I'm going to create a distant light. And then let's have another look at the render view. Uh, and we can see perhaps not very well that this is now creating a nice reflection here. Let's zoom in on that. and have another look at the render. And we can see that it does now look much more like some chrome. Well, the next thing I want to do is add a glass material here to this central vase. So let's again go into the shop context, material palette. Uh, I'm Again, not going to use the material that comes with Houdini. I'm going to set this up using the Mantra Surface Builder. So let's lay one down, and let's call it Glass. And the first part of this is the same as for a chrome material. That is that we want a very low diffuse intensity, a very low base color. We want to enable reflections. We want to have quite a high specular intensity. I can leave the specular color as white for glass. And I'm going to reduce the specular angle right down to, say, 3. So it's quite sharp reflections. I'm going to enable the reflection of objects. and I can leave those settings as they are. And I also then need to enable refraction. And the index of refraction determines the bending of the light. And in fact, for crystal glass, a value of 1.4 is about right. So I'm going to enable refractions. I'm going to have a, a refraction intensity of something quite high, say 0.8. And I can leave uh, the rest of this as uh, it is. I'm going to give it a little tiny refraction minimum of 0.1. Let's see what that looks like. And there we are. We can see we're getting quite an interesting effect. I want to just check whether the normals are correctly facing on that vase object. So let's go into wireframe mode, select display object normals. And actually we can see they're facing inwards. So I'm going to just correct that uh, because that the direction of the normals is important when you're using refraction because the index of refraction is worked out based on which direction the normal is facing in. So let's go into this Click reverse, add a reverse node here, and select it. So this should mean, uh, we can turn off the display of normals now, this should mean 
that we get a slightly different render. Yes, that's looking better. Now we can see we've got a problem here because our glass is giving us a solid shadow, which is not realistic. Unfortunately, there is a way to fix this using the shader that we've just put down, which is if we have a look here on the opacity tab, it's important not to change the opacity here because that's not to do, the opacity here is to do with the opacity of the micro polygons for Mantra. And that's not quite the same as the opacity of the object. Uh, but down the bottom here, we've got Enable False Caustics. And we can change the minimum, the maximum shadow like this. And we can see now we get a nice, quite good looking glass shadow here, which is semi-transparent. One other thing I want to quickly cover is how to make this into an object which is not solid glass. Uh, but is made up of thin panes of glass. At the moment, uh, the renderer is assuming that this object is solid glass in between the external surface here and the inner tube. And uh, that may be fine, that may be the type of vase that we've got, uh, but the alternative is here on the Refractions tab to select something called Thin Film Refraction. And that will mean that this assumes that the glass is actually a thin sheet of glass rather than a solid object. And we get a slightly different effect if we enable that. Something else that I need to do uh, is to sort out uh, the rendering of this vase because I think it is probably not being rendered and should be rendered as a subdivision surface. So that should give us a slightly smoother effect. So we can see we're getting a very bright reflection here onto our glass. And this is in fact caused by the distant light reflecting off the wood here and that reflection being caught on the glass. And the reason that's happening is because when we set up our wood material, uh, which we'd assumed was going to be a diffuse material without much of a specular component, I in fact left on, uh, and it's on by default, the reflect lights option here. And if I turn that off, uh, we can see that that big highlight disappears. But I'm going to leave it on, but I'm going to give this a very small specular intensity, 0 0.05. And that gives us a nice just gentle highlight in here. The next thing I want to do is have a look at the bulb of this lamp. So let's turn off the display of the cover and let's create a material that we're going to use for our bulb. And I'm going to lay down another mantra surface. Let's find that in here, and I'm going to call this bulb. Now this is going to be an emissive material, so it's just going to emit light. It's not going to interact with other lights in the scene, so we can turn off the enable diffuse lighting. We can turn off reflect lights, and then on the emission tab here, we're going to enable emission. And I'm going to give it a slightly yellowy color. Maybe like so. Uh, I'm going to turn off for the moment emission illuminates objects. So let's just see what it looks like. Like this. I'm going to zoom in and see what it looks like. And of course it would help if I applied the material to the bulb. And what we should find is that we'll get, here we are, a glowing bulb. So it's just outputting that color rather like a constant shader would. 
now the next step is to see whether we can get this to interact with our scene and actually to illuminate our scene and to do that and to see that more clearly I'm just going to lay down a clay material and I'm going to temporarily apply that to the vase and what I want is for this bulb here to actually illuminate the vase and what I'm going to do is just take our distant light and turn down its intensity so that we'll be able to see things more clearly. So we want this light to illuminate the vase. Now let's see what happens when we turn on the Emission Illuminates Objects tick box here in our material. And we can see nothing much changes. And the reason for that is that we need to have diffuse bounces, irradiance, or final gathering turned on. Those are all terms which refer to the same thing. And you'll be familiar with the concept if you've seen the videos I did on global illumination. Uh, but because we are by default uh, using just the standard micropolygon renderer, we're going to have to add the global illumination light to the scene in order for that uh, reflection, if you like, of this, this bulb to work. So let's control click the global illumination light. And this has created that. Now, I don't uh, want it to use the default, which is a photon map. I want it to use irradiance only. And I want it to perhaps have, say, 64 samples. Now, this is a slightly different workflow from the workflow in Houdini 10, and I hope to do a video later on, on the differences. But for the moment, uh, this is sufficient to get our bulb reflected in our vase. So what we should see, if this is working, is that this is reflecting our bars. And let me turn off completely this distant light so that we can see that more clearly. And there we can see now that this is the only thing that's illuminating our scene. Let's revert back to a full view and see what this looks like. And there we are. And I can increase the intensity of this, like so. And we can see that that's producing a nice bright effect here. Now, if I wanted to achieve the same effect in PBR, and let's just switch off this light. If I swap my output node to render using physics based rendering, then I need to set this up using the diffuse limit here. And I need to give myself a diffuse limit of at least one. And then, as you can see, that starts to illuminate the scene using the light. Let's revert back to using micropolygon rendering and switch back on our GA light. So the final thing I want to do is to set up some shading for the lampshade here. And there are a number of ways that I could do this, one of which is to use a subsurface scattering shader to scatter light from the inside here, which is illuminated by the bulb to the outside. I could also set up a, 
double-sided shader. Uh, but in fact, what I'm going to do now is cheat. And I'm going to cheat by using, again, a Mantra Surface Builder shader. And I'm going to adapt it so that it can use, and let's call this, say, lamp shade. And we're going to have a look at it, and we're going to change the emission here so that it can take not just a single color, uh, but a texture. And I'm going to demonstrate a slightly different way of achieving this. So let's have a look at our shop context. Dive into our lampshade. And we're going to need to alter the part of this that goes in to the emission color here. So let's double click that. Let's get rid of that link, like so. And in fact, uh, I can use the new facility in Houdini 11 to add a texture map to this input. And there are two ways that I can do that. Either, as we demonstrated before, I can middle click on this input and then I could select texture map. Or I can hit P to bring up a parameters editor. And then I can find the, make sure we've got the right uh, node selected. We need to select this one here. Surface model. Uh, if I find emission here and I find emission color, we can see that there is a shader effects menu little button here. And if I left click this, I get you can't see it on the screen, but I'm getting exactly the same menu as I would if I middle clicked the input. And I can select texture map. And that thinks about that for a second. And now we can see if we go down here to emission somewhere down here, emission color. We have, let me get rid of the parameters editor. We have a connector here going to here. We've got a texture. Uh, we've got a tint. We've got a texture. We've got a UV chords. And we've got a texture here. So let's have a look at this, and we can see that the texture name is got a little attachment here, this little node, which means that it's got a parameter attached to it. If I bring up the parameter editor, we can see that it's just at the moment called map, and I want to call it emission map, spell emission right, like so. And then we've got a tint parameter, which is again taking a and I can rename this to emission tint. And as you can see, just by selecting this this node here, we get to edit the parameter. So let's uh, see what that does for us. And this should give us a texture map in our emissions. But we're going to need to edit the parameters again at the material level. Uh, but before that I'm going to just uh, save this like so in case uh, Houdini crashes. And let's hit U to go up a level, P to bring up the parameter editor. And what we'll see here is that right at the bottom We've got the emission map and the emission tint. So let's edit the parameter interface again. And let me click these two. And then and we're getting the same problem as we did before. Try selecting both of them, otherwise I need to move them separately. There we go, we've got both of them. And I'm going to whiz up here until we get to the emissions setting. 
here we are and then I'm going to dump them into the emissions folder and then if I click accept we hopefully see that they're now part of the emissions tab I can now select my shade JPG which is my map that I prepared earlier for this and let's have a look and see what this now looks like and unfortunately this has crashed I'm going to recover the scene pause the video and then I'm going to recover the scene so I've now recovered that scene and what I need to do is make sure that my emission map is set up correctly I've reduced the intensity here of of the emission and I'm going to drag and drop this material onto the lampshade and then let's have a look at a render view and see what that looks like and we can see that's now producing a nice illuminated lampshade so the final thing I'm going to do is demonstrate a cheat which is slightly easier to use and gives a slightly more realistic result than this uh, use of the bulb as an emitter uh, and that is to embed a point light inside the bulb so let's lay down a point light I'm going to just put it at the origin for the moment switch to a wireframe view and I'm going to lift this up so that it's sitting pretty much in the center of the bulb and I need to make sure that the bulb isn't going to cast a shadow otherwise we wouldn't see the light at all because it's surrounded by the bulb and I can do that by bringing up a light linker pane and if I turn it to the shadow mask type and I select my point light we've got a list of the objects here which at the moment are casting shadows from this light and at the moment it's every object in the scene if I control click the bulb entry here then the bulb is going to not uh, cast shadows which is what we want so what we should find is that when we render this we get let me set it to the right camera we get a light that casts shadows and we'll just wait for it to output uh, the scene and render and I've enlarged uh, the size of the desk here so that we can see it quite clearly and we can see that it's casting a proper shadow here let me to speed things up I'll, I'll just switch off this global illumination light so that we can see the final render and there we have it a use of various different materials in Houdini 11. So as the final part of this series we're going to just look quickly at the new workflow for creating a shader in Houdini 11 and I'm in the shop context here and in order to create a new shader I need to use the tab menu the materials submenu and lay down a material shader builder like this and I'm going to rename this my shader and it's important not to get this confused with the version of this that's in the palette this is an empty shader in effect there's nothing inside just the basic nodes so let's have a look and when we go down inside we see that we get the output collect node that I discussed earlier and then connected to that are all the possible output types so the output type for surface shader for a displacement shader for light and for fog now in general you're going to only use one or perhaps two of these you might combine a surface and a displacement shader and a fog shader but you're not going to combine that with a light shader just for the purposes of this example I'm going to delete all of these because we're just going to use a the surface outputs to create a surface shader and I'm going to create a very basic shader 
And I'm going to use the old-fashioned lighting model, uh, which allows me to set up some Oranaya, in other words, some ordinary clay-like material lighting. And I want to promote some of these parameters. I want some of these parameters to appear in the editor, the property editor for the material. And I can do that, as I mentioned earlier, by middle clicking on the input and selecting promote parameter. And I can also promote the U roughness. Now, in general, you don't need to connect the surface global normal to the normal input of a node. And indeed, the incident vector you don't need to connect either, because if there is no connection here, then it uses the defaults. So I'm going to take the color from this, and then I'm going to add it like this. And the other thing I'm going to have is a normal falloff node. And what a normal falloff node is, is it's something that controls a quantity according to the angle between the normal and the incident vector. So in this case, the angle between the camera ray and the normal. And it's probably easier to see this in action rather than explain it. And then I'm going to use a color mix. And I'm going to use this falloff value to mix between two colors. So let's bring up the parameter editor. And I'm going to set the primary parameter to black. And then we're going to add these two together. So we're going to get a sort of glow as a result of this. And then I'm going to connect the combination to the surface color output like that. And what this should give us is a basic clay-like material with a glow. And I want to actually turn this into a parameter. So promote parameter there with a glow which uh, will allow us to see how the normal falloff works. So let's just see whether that's worked. Let's go up here. I'm going to assign this to the ball that I've already got in the scene. Now let's have a look at our render view. And let's re-render that. And we can see we've got a glow. So I can go into my normal falloff. And by increasing the exponent, I'll reduce the size of that glow. So that's how to create a shader in Houdini 11. And the workflow, other than this final element of the surface output node connecting into the output collect, and the editing of parameters here at the material level rather than using the output collect or the output node, those are the only things that are different about building a shader in Houdini 11. So the tutorials which are up on the site about shader building still broadly apply for Houdini 11. So that brings us to the end of this introduction to shading in Houdini 11. I hope it's been useful.